so this will be, uh, yeah, I like rational gas quadrature, and it seems quite natural to apply them to Gilkis matrix functions. So that is what I will uh, Yeah, and so that is what I will do. And um, uh, there are um, there are many people here in the audience who I've worked on. Uh, approximation of Stiltis functions. And uh, what is new in this talk is to uh, see how we can use rational gas quadrature for this. So, but uh, let me see here. First things first, uh, congratulations, Claude. And uh, I think it's really great that uh, you, Michaela, Anna, Bernd, have put this conference together. I enjoy much be, uh, being here. This is a nice place, and now in particular, since many of us haven't been at conferences for some time, it's extra nice to be here. So I, I really appreciate your work. Um, so my first question was, of course, well, uh, what, what am I going to talk about? It should be related to Claude's work. So then one looks quickly at Claude's CV, and oh, well, uh, one might get sort of say, oh no, uh, I, this is too much, right? So Claude has written roughly five papers a year for 50 years. <laughs> and uh, uh, only half a book a year. <laughs> I'm still working on my first book. In fact, I haven't started yet. <laughs> uh, and uh, so, um, most books and papers are on linear algebra, rational approximation, and extrapolation. And I, I will cover two of these topics, right? I will skip the extrapolation for uh, Claude's 90th birthday. <laughs> uh, many uh, of the papers are in books, are co authored with Michaela. And I must say, they, they have quite a working relationship, right? I mean, uh, for some people, writing five papers a year and a half a book for many, many years uh, meant, means the end of a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Claude and Michiel are going strong. Um, so um, anyway, so let's get started. So the, the approximation problem is more or less the usual here. Uh, don't see any dot here. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, uh, we want to approximate f of a, and so v. Uh, uh, lowercase v is a vector, uh, a is a large symmetric positive definite matrix, and f is some function, in particular still this function, so here, here they are, right, in the bottom, and, yeah, and um, uh, so there is a, it's defined by a measure d mu, and uh, what we do is, uh, first we look at some examples, v to the minus a, for instance, or log of 1 plus z over z, they can all be expressed as Stiltis functions. And as I mentioned, there are a couple of people here in the audience and many others who have worked on Stiltis function and approximation of these. Um, so um, we will start here with uh, spectral factorization. Not that we need to compute it in the end, but it tells us what's going on. Uh, so. Um, so uh, the eigenvalues are lambda 1 through lambda n, and they're all positive. And uh, uh, then we, uh, yeah, we can go quickly. We, we write this uh, uh, expression uh, of uh, v transpose f of a v. Uh, we plug in the spectral factorization. And uh, there is a new measure showing up here, d nu. And that measure is. Uh, Comes is defined by the matrix and the vector v. So the corresponding distribution function can be chosen to be a piecewise constant uh, function with jumps at the eigenvalues of, of a. So we so we have the measure d, d mu, and so the mu measure which defines the Stiltis function. We, we, yeah, it's in the end not all that important for what we are going to do. Um, so my starting point is. Gerard's book from 2010, and there he discusses um, Gauss quadrature and how that relates to linear algebra. I mean, I, personally, I think quadrature is kind of boring, but uh, uh, the connection with linear algebra I like. And uh, so, so here it is, and we can, one can read this in, in a, a Gerard's book. I was thinking, yeah, so uh, 
M steps of the uh, symmetric Lanzer process applied to A with an initial vector V uh, gives this uh, Lanzer decomposition. I assume here no breakdown because of, uh, that's just a technical here. And uh, then the matrix V has M columns, they're also normal, and they span the screw subspace Km. Tm is an M by M symmetric triangle matrix. And what is important here, uh, yeah, here's the Lanzos algorithm, and there we define, we see how the, uh, the short recurrence relation. I was thinking of doing a Girard on this and say, well, we all know Lanzos, so I don't have to show it, <laughs> just like <laughs> the conjugate gradient method. And we, I, I think we do, but here, here it is anyway. Uh, and um, um, yes, and what is important here is that these vectors Vj, which are generated here by the Lanzos uh, algorithm. Uh, we generate V0, V0, V1, V2, etc. that they can be express, expressed as a polynomial in A times the original matrix vector V, and then the orthogonality of the vectors Vj corresponds to uh, orthogonality of these polynomials Pj, uh, with respect to the measure d mu. So we never actually compute these polynomials, we just compute the vectors, but you have to know that uh, it, this is behind this. So therefore, uh, this is the relation to Gauss quadrature. So we have orthogonal polynomials. Uh, the Gauss quadrature rule is stated up there. So uh, uh, Tm is this symmetric tridiagonal matrix generated by the m steps of the Lanzos method. And then one can show that uh, this quadrature rule is exact for all polynomials of degree at most m to m minus one, and one can look in Girard's book for proof, right? And um, um, so far, so good. So then one says, uh, stilted functions, I mean, they, they cannot be so well approximated by polynomials. Well, on a small interval, yes, but on a long, uh, uh, stilted functions require, uh, there we integrate from zero to, uh, to infinity. So it would be more meaningful to uh, not use a polynomial approximation, but a rational approximation. And so this is what we will do, right? So we'll define orthogonal rational functions. And um, uh, so the alpha case, they are the poles, and uh, we can choose them real, with a strictly uh, uh, negative poles or complex conjugate, as we wish. Uh, there is really no real reason to choose some complex conjugate in general, but uh, it, it's, it's doable. And uh, uh, so we will just go over that very quickly. So the, yeah, the set Q, yeah, here we go. This, the set Q is this set of rational functions. And the cap P is a set of all polynomials. And, uh, what we will do then is we will uh, define a sequence of elementary basis functions for p plus q. And uh, uh, so here they are, the elementary basis functions. It's one of these functions here listed. And the re now the ordering of these functions is important. Because, I mean, it, this also happens if you just work with polynomials. I mean, if you start with a polynomial of degree 10, followed by a polynomial of degree 5, and then a polynomial of the degree 7, uh, there's not going to be a three-term recurrence relation. So, so we need to order these. And uh, so we have this inner product with a new measure. Uh, and uh, this is my, this, my notation for uh, one function comes before the other, and what you require is that basically lower powers come before higher powers. And this is uh, for si uh, simple poles or complex conjugate poles. It, that's that's what, what we need to do. And then with this uh, property, we can then show that uh, sh short recurrence relations. Uh, how long are they? Well, they are short in the sense that the, the length, the number of terms in the recurrence relation is independent of the number of steps one takes. But how many uh, terms one needs, well, depends, for instance, on how often does a power, a positive power of, of, of x appear. If there is a long distance between consecutive positive powers, then it means at some point we need a long recursion relation. 
uh, the same, uh, uh, so here it is sort of stated. Here are the short recurrence relations in M1 and M2. These are how, they basically measure how often uh, uh, the, the mono, uh, monomials appear in, in, among the rational basis functions. And um, uh, I don't think we need all, uh, all these uh, details, but if, um, if Q is the empty set, the second part there, then we deal with polynomials. And then what we get is that uh, uh, the M, which decides on how, how many uh, terms are in the recursion relation, turns out to be one, and then we have a three-term recursion relation. This is what we want. Uh, if uh, Q is not the empty set, in, um, then, we, then the question is, how small can M be? Well, it can be two. Uh, and, um, uh, and this requires that, well, uh, after we have a pole, then we need a mon at least one monomial again, and then we need a pole again, and, uh, and after every pole we need a monomial. We cannot have consecutive poles. Then the recursion la relation becomes uh, different. So this gives a five-term recurrence relation. Uh, now, one has to go and look at all these other cases also. So for instance, how often are these uh, expression 1 over x minus alpha, how often do pow these powers appear? So that these powers appear with an increasing exponent, right? but um, how often do they appear? And that also determines um, the, the recursion relation. So I was uh, not going to go all through all the details because this is just basically tedious. Uh, and um, so, um, so here's an example. Here we have a um, naturally ordered basis, L monomials, uh, then a negative power, then another L monomials, and a negative power of x, etc. And then we get a recursion relation for uh, the function x, x times phi or k of x, which, which is 2L plus 3 terms. And uh, we, we, we get short return relation for the functions here at the bottom also. Um, uh, but uh, uh, this then leads to the rational Lanzosch method. And if, if you appreciated the short the Lanzosch methods, which I showed you for its simplicity, unfortunately, it's not quite as simple here. But the good news here, so you have to keep track of which polio, which kind of polio add, how often, and so on. But the, so here is slide one, here's another one. Uh, but the good news is that uh, the recursion relations I, I, I only have a, a, a max number of terms, so independent of how, how many iterations we, we carry out. Um, so um, so we, we apply this method, and what we get is um, the, an orthonormal basis, I call them phi j, of the rational Kula subspace. And um, um, then we get the recursion relations in the, in, for the uh, rational Lanzosch method. There is a matrix H that appears, which corresponds to the tridiagonal matrix for uh, the standard Lanzosch method. And H then has uh, its block diagonal with overlapping, somewhat overlapping blocks. And exactly uh, how these blocks the sizes depend now on how the, how the uh, basis functions enter. So here is an example in a second. Uh, I also should mention that Adama and, uh, and Karl Decker, they also defined rational functions, but they, they do it slightly different. Um, so, uh, so there are different ways of uh, uh, defining uh, rational Kulov methods, right? And uh, so here's an example of one of these matrices. Uh, you see the, um, this is uh, yeah, pentadiagonal, and you see the block structure, right? And uh, uh, so you have, uh, when you have a five diagonal, this is when you have added a pole. And otherwise, if you just add zeros, then you get uh, uh, the tridiagonal part. Um, so, yeah. Uh, 
So one goes through this, and here you get larger blocks at the bottom, because here we use these uh, pairs of complex conjugate poles, and this just affects the block structure. And um, uh, yeah, uh, at this point, you just want to, I just want you to believe me. So, so then, so let's switch now. So this was a rational Kruller subspace, and we use, we'll use it because Stieltjes functions can be approximated well by rational functions, but maybe not so well by polynomials if you're on the uh, whole uh, on half of the real axis, right? Um, and so, um, so now we want to um, uh, approximate f of a. So there we have an integral. And the way to do this now is we have a rational um, Kirlofov space. And now we want to uh, use a corresponding rational Gauss quadrature rule. And one could make the argument there is no such thing as a rational Gauss quadrature rule, which is not completely true. But it's also not completely true to say, oh, yeah, here we, we, this is a rational Gauss quadrature rule, because what these rational Gauss quadrature rules are, you have a denominator, right? You have a numerator and denominator, you have a, because you have a rational function. And then you think of the denominator as being part of the weight function. And then we construct a standard Gauss rule for this weight function. And, and, and then one switches back and says, oh, yeah, this is my rational quadrature rule. And um, so in, in, in a way, there's nothing new here, but they're quite useful. And uh, the, the, the good news is that many things that we, are, that we like, for instance, that the first components of the, if we look at standard Gauss quadrature rules, like um, uh, the ones in uh, uh, Golvin and Marron's book, there, well, one of the things is that, well, one finds the weights by, computing the first components of the eigenvectors of the tridiagonal matrix and squares them. And, uh, in, um, uh, d d this works here also, the analog. So one needs to look at this matrix age and compute uh, its spectral factorization, or at least the first components of the eigenvectors, and then one squares them. So here. Uh, what we were interested in here also, so we, we look at Golub Meran and say, oh, this is really nice. Uh, we get error bounds by combining Gauss and gauss radar rules. And what's the analog here? Well, one can do it, and sometimes it works, right? So uh, here is the remainder formula for the, for the Gauss rule here at the bottom, right? And uh, instead of having a 2m's derivative of only f, one has a 2m's derivative of the, uh, the denominator polynomial in our rational function and uh, an f. So if that expression is of constant sign, then we can tell uh, what the sign of the arrow e is. And uh, similarly with gauss radar rules, uh, the, what we do here then is, in the standard case, one says, well, a gauss radar rule, we, we um, change for, we have a tridiagonal matrix and we, 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 we take one more step of lanz sosh maybe, and then in the tridiagonal matrix, we change the last diagonal element to have the desired uh, no, uh, uh, radar node, the fixed node. And here we do the same. We, what we do is we, the last basis function we add is a polynomial, it's a, it's a monomial. And then we get this bottom part, which is sort of almost like a part of a tridiagonal. And then we can just change the last diagonal and entry in an appropriate way. And so we can get up and uh, uh, the remainder formula, everything carries over. And then if we know that this uh, uh, weight function w squared time, times f is of and the 2m plus first derivative is of constant sign, and we, uh, then we, we can use, then we can tell what the, what the remainder formula is. Now, of course, is this going to happen uh, that it is of constant sign? Well, not always, right? It's a, so we, we also look at other quadrature rules. And so, the inst for instance, some uh, years ago, uh, Dirk Lowry introduced anti Gauss rules. 
uh, the beauty of these is it's just linear algebra. You don't need to know uh, the sign of any derivatives. And um, so he, he required that uh, he constructed a, a, a Gauss type quadrature rule which gives the same error but of opposite sign uh, for all polynomials of degree 2m plus 1. So the error is 0 for all polynomials of degree 2m minus 1, and then we, add two, uh, then we get uh, degree 2m and 2m plus 1, and there we get opposite sign. And uh, the beauty of that was that it's so easy to construct. And here it is uh, similar. So I call the last off-diagonal element delta. And then the anti-Gauss rule, uh, I multiply that by square root of 2. And when does this work? Well, that's, of course, the, the catch here. And uh, if my expansion here in, in phi decays sufficiently quickly to 0, then I can show that the Gauss and anti-Gauss rule give upper and lower bounds. Uh, this condition of course, is not always easy to verify. Right? But uh, uh, in practice, it means if, if you have a smooth function, it works beautifully. Um, if you don't have a smooth function, one doesn't know, right? Um, so what one can, uh, yeah, my time is running out, so let me just go forward. And uh, there is another variation of this. And so let's just move to the computed example. Uh, so here we go. Uh, the first, so m is the number of nodes. Uh, the first, the second column is uh, the error with a Gauss quadrature rule with M nodes. And then the uh, headed one is the error with a, a rational Gauss rule. And I mean, it's, a, it's significantly smaller with the same number of nodes. Uh, then in this case, I have a Gauss Radar rule also. Uh, then the uh, t um, tilde one is my uh, anti-Gauss rule, uh, and it, you can see this is what I'm showing here is the error, so the error for the anti-Gauss rule is of opposite sign. Um, it turns out there's another way of doing this, and that is to say, well, here is the average rule, A, the one without a tilde, uh, without a thing uh, on top. Um, uh, that's the average rule, which is you, what you get the, your average, the Gauss and the anti-Gauss rule. And you say, well, this, is, this average rule is more, more uh, accurate because it matches one more moment than the Gauss rules. And, um, and then what you could do is you say, for, forget about that Gauss and anti-Gauss rules give errors of opposite sign. One could just say, compare the result for the uh, average rule with the result for the Gauss rule and use that as an error estimate. It works beautifully for also weird functions, I mean, which have singularities and all sorts of strange behavior clo uh, close to the interval of integration. Um, and um, yeah, at that, it's time to stop. Uh, uh, one thing I was going to say is, well, uh, some people in the audience like block methods. And this is when, when you place a vector v by a block column, so you replace V with a couple of, uh, with a matrix with a few columns, not too many, and then you use block land source instead, and it, it, it works. There's n nothing more to be said about it. Uh, the other comment is that, well, I used filters functions here because it's natural to uh, approximate them by uh, rational functions, but I haven't really used many properties of filters functions. So what I'm telling you here works for a large number of uh, functions, which uh, can are uh, well suited for approximation by rational functions, but, uh, but they, don't, we, they don't have to be status functions. Well, thank you. I can use my mic. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can, I can ask. Are there any questions? <laughs> no, 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 it works. Okay. So, are there any questions? <laughs> For uh, lots.
far. Yes. So it's a quite obvious question, Ben Beckerman. Uh, quite obvious question, how do you choose the poles, in fact? What kind of poles would you prefer to take in terms of complexity and yeah. in terms of approximation? Yeah, no, I mean, this is a good question. And because uh, uh, rational, these rational approximations, if you look at the uh, approximation theory literature, it's really thoughts under polynomial approximation because the, the denominator is fixed. Uh, one way to handle this is use a triple A algorithm first. And that suggests some poles, and then one uses these. Are there any other questions here? No room? Are there some questions from the people watching the video? If anybody. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Volker, no question? <laughs> uh, Volker left. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I ju I just one question. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the beginning, you mentioned that the rather um, several other people's working on silicious functions. So how do you, what, what do you, how do you, what you do compare with what they're doing? No, no, we haven't compared. Uh, I mean, for, for instance, there is this paper which I really like by uh, Andreas and Marcel, and which was an inspiration to, to look at this and say, well, Okay, maybe we can do it in a slightly different way. But they, they have error estimates. It's, it's quite clever. Uh, but they use polynomial approximation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, then uh, there is a paper by, uh, what did I mean? Gutel and Knizhneman and Robol and. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mentioned the name, but, th but they know, use you're, rational you're, you're aging also, yeah. so yeah. sometimes they you use rational more. approximation. <laughs> but the, the fo my focus here is on uh, rational yeah. gas quadrature and exactly how the methods compare. Well, we will we will see. Okay. Not done yet. No more comments or questions. So we thank Lothar again.